Well, this will be about our 14th Sunday in Galatians, and the good news is next Sunday we should be finishing up the book of Galatians. And then i got to figure out where we're going to go next. So if there's some you know, book you want me to preach through, feel free to let me know. I'll either do it or I won't. So, but I think Galatians has been pretty fun. Uh, as you remember, the last couple of Sundays we've been talking a lot about the flesh, walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. Well, we're kind of getting to the end of that, that topic right now, but today's topic is you will reap what you sow. So our main verses this morning is going to be Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. But before we get into that, I want to tell a quick story. And it's about a couple of men from Scotland. And these men from Scotland, they immigrated to California. Now when they immigrated to California, they wanted to take something with them from Scotland to California with them to help them remember where they came from. Well, one of, the, one of them brought over which is actually the national emblem for Scotland, is called the, the thistle. You know, my family heritage, you know, is Irish, but we're also part Scottish. And I never realized that from Scotland, because I had a grandmother that still, when she came over to America, or a great-grandmother, she still talked with that Scottish accent. And I never realized that their national emblem was the thistle. I wasn't involved in that vote. But anyway, he brought over the thistle. And the other Scottish man brought over honeybees. Well, as the years passed, and that one man planted a thistle, what ended up happening is that thistle took over the farmland in the area. And the bad thing is, he, it took years for him to get rid of the thistle in that farmland. Now, the other man that brought the honeybees had a completely different outcome. The honey breeze brought to the forest and the farmlands the sweetness of honey. But little did these two men know that whenever they brought these things over and they planted these things, that there would be such a difference in the effects of what they planted. But one thing we need to remember as we go through this sermon here, we look at, you will reap what you, reap what you sow, this shows right here that these two men planted something when they first got to California that affected the next several generations. So that's one thing we're going to be going over this morning. Is that as we plant our seed, it will have effect on the future generations, not only of our family, but possibly a lot of different people outside of our family. So each choice that we make, everything that we plant will have its consequences. Is we make wise choices and God-honoring choices, the experience that we will receive will be a lot more positive than it would be if we planted seeds that doesn't honor God. So with me this morning real quick, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. It says, Let him who has taught the word shall in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh, reap corruption. But he who sows the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So sowing and reaping has both positive and negative outcomes. If you sow good things, you will reap good things. If you sow honesty, you, will, you shall reap trust. If you sow goodness, you shall reap reap friends. If you sow humility, you will reap greatness. If you sow perseverance, you will reap victory. If you sow consideration, you will reap harmony. If you sow hard work, you will reap success. 
If you sow forgiveness, you will reap reconciliation. If you sow openness, you will reap intimacy. If you sow patience, you will reap improvements. If you sow faithful, you will reap miracles. If you sow the Spirit, you will reap everlasting life. That's if we're sowing the, the seeds of goodness. Now, on the other hand, we can also sow bad things. We can sow bad seeds out there. And with this, and when you do that, you will reap bad things. If you, reap, if you sow dishonesty, you will reap distrust. If you sow selfishness, you will reap loneliness. If you sow pride, you will reap destruction. On that one right there, if you remember what the Bible says, it says that pride comes before the downfall. If you sow jealousy, you will reap trouble. If you sow laziness, you will reap stagnation. If you sow bitterness, you will reap isolation. If you sow greed, you will reap loss. If you sow gossip, you will reap enemies. If you sow worries, you will reap wrinkles. That's kind of a tough one, isn't it? If you sow sin, you will reap guilt, or you also will reap the consequences. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap cor corruption. But one thing we need to remember, too, is when we do reap, whether it be good or bad, we will usually reap more than what we sow, whether it be good or bad. One thing I looked up this week, because we have so many farmers out here that raise corn. If you plant one seed of corn, and let's say that stock only produces two ears, out of that one seed, you will get approximately 1,600 kernels. So from that one kernel that was used as a seed, you will, you will reap 1,600. That's just with two ears of corn. I know there are some years that produce less, there are some years that produce more. But I looked it up on Google, it said that the average is 800 kernels per ear. So farmers, if I got that wrong, let me know later. But that just shows how planting one seed, how we can reap more than what we plant, whether it be good or bad. So with that in mind, it's imperative that we sow the right seeds. So as we go through these verses this morning, we're going to discuss how what you will reap, you will sow. So we first want to start out with the harvest, which is verse 7, and it says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he shall also reap, or he will also reap. So what God does here in verse 7, he begins with actually a warning. A warning that if we are rebellious and we plant the wrong kind of seed, that God will deal with us on that. It says God has no con consequence. If, re if we rebel against God, and here's what's happened sometimes in the world, we don't think there's going to be consequences if we rebel against God. We think if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, that there's not going to be any consequences from God when we sow the wrong seed. Well, that's not true. The consequences we'll receive when we sow the wrong seed, if we're Christians, is a separation from God in this life. One thing we forget is eternity doesn't start when we get to heaven. Eternity starts the second we accept Christ as our Savior. So when we, start, we need to make sure we're sowing the right seeds. He goes on to say, For whoever a man, whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. So what we see here is at the very beginning of these verses, the first thing he starts talking about is the harvest. Well, we know that the last thing a farmer does when he plants something is perform the harvest. But here, Paul starts out, let's, let's talk about the harvest first. But when we look at a farmer, and I hope I get all this right, is before the seed is prepared, before the seed is planted, before the fields are worked, the farmer has to have in his mind that he's eventually going to have to harvest what he plants. You know, he knows that at a certain time of year that he's going to be harvesting that corn that he's planted or that milo out there that he's planted. There's a certain time of year 
that that harvest has to happen. So one thing we need to think about in our lives when we're looking at sowing our seeds is what's going to be the harvest? What are we going to reap from what we've sowed? One thing I read this the other day is, I thought it was kind of funny, it kind of goes along, this with, along with this. Some people spend their time seeing, see, sowing wild oats, but then they pray for a crop failure. Some of us probably just now thinking right there, we're thinking back to our younger days. So when we're not planting, so when we're not sowing the right seeds, and we're having to pray for crop failure, that's not what God intended. That's not the way that it works. One of my favorite movies that I really enjoy watching, I haven't seen it in quite a while. Have you all seen the movie Secondhand Lions? It's a very funny movie, you know, but it also has a very good story in there. And one of the things that happens in this movie is these two men, they, when they were younger, they lived lives of danger and adventure. And when they had reached a certain age, they decided it was time to retire. They wanted to settle down. They wanted to do what old retired people do. So what did they do? They planted a garden. Well, it just happens that one of those traveling salesmen came by with a bunch of seeds. And they thought they were planting green beans, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, lettuce, and other things. And they worked this garden very hard. You know, they planted the seed. They went out there. They made sure there wasn't no weeds. They, they hoed it. So, and they watered it. But after several weeks, they realized that all they planted was corn. Well, what had happened is this traveling salesman kind of pulled the wool over their eyes. They thought they were getting all these other seeds, and all they got was corn. So sometimes we think we're planting something and we're not. And we're actually going to end up reaping something else. You know, you, most of you know that me and, me and Pam lived in Montana for several years. In fact, Pam was born and raised in Montana. Well, we're right up there on the Canadian border, and right next to Montana is North Dakota. One of the jokes in Montana was about a story about a guy that bought a truckload of donut seeds and went to North Dakota and made a fortune. I mean, he bought a truckload of Cheerios, he went to North Dakota and made a fortune selling donut seeds over there. So I'm sure that they, when they sowed that, they didn't really reap what they expected either. The second point I want to make is the seed in verse 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So when we look at the first part of verse 8 there, it's talking about the flesh. In the first part of it says, I'll read it again, for he who sows to, the, to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You know, we've seen the word flesh all through Galatians here. The flesh is a natural, a natural part of us that wants to live life on our own terms. It wants to live, live life the fun way. It doesn't want to live life according to what we're told by God. So what we have is we're supposed to be living a spiritual life, but the flesh is constantly putting up a fight. Our spirit knows what kind of life we should live, that we should be obeying God. But this temporary house that we have called the flesh is always fighting against it and always trying to tell us, go ahead and live the way you want. So what happens is we end up failing in our walk with the Spirit and instead are fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. It's a constant battle that we fight every day. And I guarantee you, no matter how close you are to God, you still have those battles with the flesh. I can tell you as your pastor, I have those same struggles every day. I have the battles with the flesh. We all do. If anybody ever tells you that they never have to battle their flesh, they're lying to you. Because everybody has that struggle. I've read some of Billy Graham's writings, and he even admits that he has struggles daily with his flesh. It's something we all have to deal with. There's a man named John R. Scott, and he wrote, Every time we allow our minds to harbor a grudge, nurse a grievance, entertain an impure fancy, 
wallow in self-pity. We are sowing the seeds of flesh. Every time we linger in bad company, whose insidious influence we know we cannot resist. Every time we lie in bed when we ought to be, when we ought to be up and praying. Every time we read pornographic literature. Every time we take a risk that strains our self-control, we are sowing to the flesh. And we're told here that when we sow to the flesh, what we will reap is corruption. Corruption, the definition of corruption is decay, ruin, and destruction. And over time, rebelling against God destroys a person. Even if you're a Christian and you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you rebel against God, it will lead to the destruction of your flesh. Just like a disease leads to the destruction of our flesh. And in both cases, it's not always a fast destruction. It's a slow destruction. It destroys us one step at a time. Some people say, I know I'm saved. But if I'm honest, I have sown the seeds of corruption. So people, even though they're saved, they admit that they've sown the seeds of corruption. But the bad thing is, now there's pastors out there helping them sow those seeds of destruction. Because they're saying, and I've actually heard a, a, a pastor on TV say this one time, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior... You can go ahead and do whatever you want because you're already saved. It's just a phase that you're going through. That's not the truth. That's going to lead to the destruction of your flesh. And if that's the kind of seeds that we're, that we're sowing, my best advice to you is get a new bag of seeds because you need to be sowing a different kind of, kind of seed. Now, there's another type of seed that we should be sowing. We just talked about the flesh. We need to be sowing to the Spirit. We look at the second part of verse 8. It says, But he who sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. When we sow to the Spirit, what we're doing, what we're doing is we're sowing something that pleases God. And we do this continually. It increases the influence that the Holy Spirit has on our life. So if we continually sow in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps strengthen us. It helps, helps our spirit in its fight against our flesh. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to help us, then that fight becomes easier and easier because we're more and more of that fight we're turning over to the Holy Spirit. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of John MacArthur. You know, I've, I've read some of his things. You know, I read some of his commentaries. Some of his commentaries are very, very good. So I want to read what he writes in one of his commentaries about sowing to the Spirit. And he wrote, To sow to the Spirit is the same as to walk in the Spirit. To sow in the Spirit is the same as to be led by the Spirit. To sow to the Spirit is the same as to be filled with the Spirit. And he backs each one of these up with, the, with Scripture. To sow to the Spirit is the same as abiding in Christ. To sow to the Spirit is the same as continuing in Christ's Word. To sow to the Spirit is the same as walking in Christ. To sow to the Spirit is the same as setting one's mind on the things above and not on the things of this world. And he finishes up this part of his, with this saying right here. To sow to the Spirit is the same as giving one's body as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable, acceptable to God. And he finishes up these verses with this verse, and I know I didn't give it to you up there, so don't yell at me. It says, we are to be conformed to this, we are not to be conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
So we're told that we're to sow, by the, that we are to, sow to the Spirit and that we will re- reap everlasting life. And like I said, everlasting life means eternity. And that eternity does, that, does not start when we get to heaven. Like I said earlier, that's, that eternity starts on the second that we accept Christ as our Savior. That's when our eternity starts. That's when our eternity starts with our relationship with God. So when we sow the right seeds, not only are we fighting this battle, but we're not fighting it alone. We have the Holy Spirit on our side. We have God on our side. We have, the, we have Christ on our side. I can guarantee you, if you have Christ on your side, you've already won the victory. No matter what goes on in your life, you've already won. Because he's there with us fighting the battle. But the bad thing is, you still have Satan out there pointing a finger at you. Saying, I know what you're like. I know what you've done. And so that's his way of battling us. That's his only tool. Once we accept Christ as our Savior, his only tool is to try to put things in front of us that make us doubt our fight with, with the world. He puts it out there that it's easier to not to obey God than it is to obey God. But as long as you've got God on your side, the fight's easy. And the longer you sow the right seed, the easier and easier that fight gets. Another story I want to tell real quick is many years ago, ill health compelled two missionaries that were over in Africa to return to America. They were having health issues, so they had to come back home. And they only left six believers because they'd only been stationed there a short time. And they dared not hope that they would find any Christians on their return two years later. For how could six recent converts stand alone in an African village? They found, however, that that small group had met several times a week for prayer, Bible study, and had witnessed so faithfully for Christ that all the neighboring villages knew that they were Jesus men. So is it any wonder that the church grew into a great congregation and that on the 25th anniversary of this church, 7,000 people gathered together for a communion service. 7,000 in which the sacrament was celebrated by three African ministers. And the bread and wine was distributed by 24 native elders. So even though these two missionaries were only there a short time before they had to return home for two years because of health issues, their recent converts never gave up. So the seed that they had sowed in these converts the Holy Spirit took over when they couldn't be there. The Holy Spirit continued the fight for them with these new believers. And these new believers continued to spread the word. Not from the knowledge that they gained from man, but from the knowledge that they gained from the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes it real clear that God says that my name, my word is not written in ink, but my word is written in the hearts and minds of my people. And we, when we read that, then we know that our knowledge not come, does not come from man, but from the Holy Spirit. So now we've looked at the harvest. Next thing we want to look at is that the laborer. Verse 9, it says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. This refers to the one who is sowing the seeds, the actual laborer. And what it's talking about is the seeds of the Holy Spirit that we're planting. If we continue in the Spirit, we will endure. We will endure till the end, and we will, we will endure until we receive our reward in heaven. Now, I won't lie to you. Sometimes this work is hard. Sometimes it feels like we're planting all uphill. Sometimes it feels like that we're, we're working the fields for God that everything is against us. Everything in the world is against us. Well, the world is against us. If you remember, Satan is the ruler of this world. 
So he's going to do everything he can to interfere with our labor. He's going to do everything he can to interfere with our sowing of the right seeds, of the sowing of the seed of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 tells us, Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's no guarantee that we will have all that we want in this life. We're not promised material possessions. We're not promised the things that we would want in this world. But we are promised treasures in heaven. Matthew 16, 19 through 20 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. We get tied up so much in our worldly possessions. We have a nice, we want a nice house, we want a nice car. But we're told we're not to worry about that. All that stuff is going to disappear one of these days. One thing we tend to forget is this body that we're in is just temporary. God planted us, His Spirit within us. We are a soul that is using this flesh as a temporary house. And during this time that we live in this temporary house, that's the time we make the decision on what kind of seed we're going to sow. Are we going to sow the bad seed or are we going to sow the good seed? Are we going to accept Christ as our Savior or are we going to reject Him? One thing I hear all the time is, I don't want to worship a God that sends people to hell. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God sends people to hell. The Bible says that the ones that go to hell are the ones that made the choice to go there. They made the choice to, re to reject our Savior. They made the choice that during this temporary life that we have here on earth that they wanted to live for themselves and not for God. So it's not easy as a Christian when we're out there so laboring in the fields. Paul was faithful in his labor for the Lord and he was beheaded. Peter was faithful in his labor with the Lord and he was crucified upside down. James was faithful in his labor and he was beheaded. John the Baptist was faithful and he was also beheaded. John the Apostle was faithful in his labor for the Lord and was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And the remainder of the apostles were faithful in their labor and they all died as a result. That's what the apostles were willing to do to plant the good seed. That's what they were able, they, they were willing to die in order to spread the word of God and the saving grace of Christ's blood. They were good laborers in the field. But sometimes, even as Christians, sometimes we, we're not willing to really make a sacrifice. How much are we willing to sacrifice to spread God's word? How much are we willing to sacrifice to make sure people hear about the blood of Christ? Now, I will say this. There are people all over the world who faithfully read their Bible. They pray diligently. They are devoted to the church. They give to the Lord. They witness to the lost. They seek to restore the fallen Christians. Now, the world's not going to know their name like they know the names of the apostles. But they are out there sowing seeds of the Spirit. We have many people in this church right here right now that meet that description. That they're faithfully serving God. And I, I guarantee you, every one of us, at some time in our walk, and maybe at many times in our walk, we get pretty tired, don't we? That sowing the good seed and, and laboring the fields for God it just gets us down sometimes. It's hard because we're battling the world. But remember what Paul said in verse 9, and let us not grow weary while doing, the, while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Let's look at Psalms 126, verses 5 through 6. It says, 
Those who in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with, us, with him. So even though we're struggling now, we are promised eternal life. We know that at one point, after we die, that we know that instantly we're going to be in heaven. But this right here is telling that once we're in heaven, then when Jesus comes back to reign the world for a thousand years, we're going to be with him. We're going to be the ones standing by his side ruling the world. Now, Revelation doesn't exactly tell me how, how that's going to happen, but it does promise us that we will be ruling with Jesus during that thousand years. Now, is he going to take a part of the world and turn that over to, to one of his followers to rule? I think that would be pretty neat if he did that myself especially if we get to choose what part of the world we want to rule I want some place where there's a lot of trees a lot of lakes some rivers but it's going to be up to God and how that's going to work I really don't know there's a guy named Sonny Captain Benibo he was a mission he's actually a native missionary to Nigeria and he wrote one time Oh, scatter seeds of loving deeds along the fertile field. For grain will grow from what you sow, a fruitful harvest yield. Though sown in tears through weary years, the seed will surely live. Though great the cost, it is not lost, for God will fruit each give. The harvest home of God will come, and after toil and care, with joy untold, our sheaves of cold will all be garnered there. So what that's saying is keep working the fields no matter how hard it is because it is worth it. The reward that we receive in heaven is worth what we're going through here. So finally, we've got to look at the season. In verse 10 it says, Therefore we have opportunity. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the house that hold the faith. So when it comes to harvest, there are certain times of the year that you harvest certain types of crops. I can guarantee you I don't know a whole lot about farming, but I do know that we don't plant corn in Oklahoma with the intent of harvesting in December. That I do know. But when the time does come to prepare for the harvest, you will see activity on that farm seven days a week until the job is done. When it's time to prepare the soil, you'll see tractors out there getting it done. Not by themselves, of course. they got somebody inside controlling them. Though I have been told that some of these tractors now can almost do it themselves. No. The Hedrick brothers told me that they got machinery now that you kind of push a couple buttons, the satellite takes over and, and drives you down the end of the field. All you got to do is turn the tractor around. And it takes over again and drives you to the other end of the field. You know, with a few days of training, I might be able to handle that. But when it's time to plant the seed, there will be people in the field. When it comes time to work the fields, there will be people doing that too. And when it comes time to harvest... I know these farmers will be out there seven days a week until that harvest is in, until they've completed their job. We as Christians need to be the same way. First, we've got to sow to the Spirit. Then we've got to harvest. You know, sometimes we're not going to be the same person that harvests that sows the seed. But each and every day of our lives, we are blessed that as Christians we have the opportunity to sow to the Spirit. We can and should serve others if we're Christians. And we should do it not in our name, but in Christ's name. Now, as Christians, we cannot solve all the problems of the world. God doesn't expect us to solve all the problems of the world. And one thing He does not want us trying to do is solve the problems of the world the way we think they should be solved. I guarantee you we'd, make it, we'd probably make it worse than what it already is. But he set us here to sow the seeds. 
to sow the seeds of the Spirit. He put us here to help with the cultivation of these seeds of the Spirit. And he put us here not to perform the harvest, but to help with the harvest. So my question is today, as a Christian, are you ready to do what's needed to spread the seeds of, the, of faith? And my second question is, if you have not accepted Christ as your, as your Savior, are you ready to accept the challenge? And the challenge is, if you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, the easiest thing that you're ever going to do as a Christian is to come forward and accept Christ as your Savior. Here's what it takes to become a Christian. You've got to profess the name of Christ before people. And that's why we have this invitation. That if you have not accepted Christ your Savior, we're giving you the opportunity to step forward and come forward and say the sinner's prayer. And by doing that, you're acknowledging before men that you are now the Son of God. And once you've done that, then God says, I, Jesus says, then I will profess you before my Father. When you accept Christ your Savior, that doesn't mean the battle is over. It means it's just beginning. But you're no longer having to fight the world on your own. You now have Christ standing beside you. And you have the Holy Spirit within you helping you with this battle. So please stand with me this morning as we have our invitation.